بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حديث number 101 of our book عمدة الأحكام was narrated by Mother Aisha may Allah be pleased with her who would give us the honor to read it for us Yes, brother. Narrated Aisha, the Prophet ﷺ, sent an army unit under the command of a man who used to lead his companions in the prayers and would finish his recitation with Surah 112. Say, O Muhammad ﷺ, He is Allah, the one. When they returned from the battle, they mentioned that to the Prophet ﷺ. He said to them, Ask him why he does so. They asked him and he said, I do so because it is a description of the beneficent and I love to recite it in my prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, Tell him that Allah loves him. Bukhari. Now this hadith is regarding an incident that took place at the time of the Prophet ﷺ when one of his companions used to conclude his recitation of the Quran in prayer by reciting Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. And there are a different and a number of narrations of this hadith. Among them was that his companions complained. And they said to him, either you think that your recitation is not sufficient and that is why you're reciting Qul huwa Allahu Ahad with it, or you recite Qul huwa Allahu Ahad alone. Why combine two surahs? And especially always he said well this is the way I pray whether you like it or not suit yourself you want another Imam get another Imam but I will always recite when they asked the man why do you do this he justified that by saying it's a surah that includes the description of Ar Rahman and I love it because of that so the Prophet ordered them to tell him that Allah loves him because of his love to this surah. The issue here that we can learn is one, if you love Allah's beautiful names and attributes, Allah will love you. And we've stated this so many times. It is unfortunate that you have people talking about things of lesser importance while they're ignorant about the names and attributes of Allah. People talking whether it is permissible to put your hand on your chest or under your navel. And if you ask him what is the meaning of Al-Muqit, one of Allah's names, I'm not, is it? First time I hear this name, they don't know the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And they cannot explain the meaning of Al-Latif, for example, or Al-Qahar, or Al-Jabbar, and so on, you go on and on. So this is an indication of our ignorance because we do not know whom we are praying for. Whom are we praying to? Allah Azza wa What is his description? I have no idea. So this man's love to the description of Allah in this beautiful surah resulted in Allah Azza wa loving him. And by far, if Allah loves you, then you have got it made. Because if Allah loves you, you care less about anything else. If Allah loves you, everything else would love you. The Prophet said والسلام, that Allah, when he loves one of his servants, he tells Jibreel, I love this person, so love him. And Jibreel tells the people of the heavens, Allah loves this person, so love him. And they all love him. And Allah descends acceptance for that individual in earth or on earth, meaning that everyone on earth would accept him and love him. So the love of Allah is extremely great. Secondly, the man was the leader of an expedition, of an army unit, and he was the leader of the prayer as well, which we learn from that is whoever assumes the position of leadership, he should also lead the prayer. Even if there were people better than him in recitation in his unit. And that is why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that 
it is not permissible to lead prayer in a man's home or in his authority so if you go to a company for example or a government institution which has a manager it is not permissible for me to lead prayer just because I'm the sheikh unless he authorizes it so he's the leader he's the manager of that institution he's the one who's supposed to lead if he doesn't want to lead he may authorize anyone he likes and you have to obey that in his house if I go into his house and the man is shaved and he smokes and he does so many wrong things but he's a Muslim he prays on time and it's time for Maghrib I do not come forward and say Aqim Salat no this is not my right to lead the prayer of a man in his house unless he accepts that and authorizes that among the things that we can learn from this hadith that when you report something to the leader or to the man in authority this is not considered to be backbiting we have an institution we have a school we have a company and one of the employees does something that goes against the law if I report this to the manager would I be backbiting no this is for the welfare of the company this is for the welfare of the school my intention is not to corrupt my intention is to bring things into order and that is why they went to the Prophet والسلام, and sought his religious opinion to what the man is doing among the things that we learn from this is that it is permissible to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas or any other surah after the main surah we recite so if I recite for example Surat Al-Qalam and then afterwards I recite Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad is this permissible? it is permissible yet is it recommended or not? scholars differed some of them said that by the Prophet والسلام, approving it this means that it is permissible and it is part of the Sunnah others say no 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 hold on and hold your horses don't jump into conclusions though the Prophet ﷺ approved of it he never done it in his life is that true? Prophet ﷺ never recited Surat Al-Ikhlas after any Surah he recited it was never reported to us and that is why they said though it is permissible yet it is not recommended why? they said because we have two actions the action of the Prophet ﷺ and the action of his companion what would you always choose? the best which is the action of the Prophet ﷺ however if you do the latter it's permissible can you give another example? I said yes a lot of examples but the time does not permit or actually I know only a, a couple examples but anyhow the Prophet ﷺ when he visited Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As and he was newly wed and after he got married Amr ibn al-As may Allah be pleased with him and with his son went to see his son so he went to see his daughter-in-law and he asked her how was my son with you the previous days she said MashaAllah he is the best of men praying all night and fasting every single day MashaAllah so Amr ibn al-As one of, one of the smartest Arabs one of the smartest companions of the Prophet understood what she meant she meant that he did not even touch me because he's all the time either praying or fasting where will it be possible? so he went to the Prophet and complained Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet went to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As to check on him so he told him how do you recite the Quran? he said I recite the Quran once every day he finishes the whole Quran in prayer once every night so he said don't do this finish the Quran once every 30 days say I can do more say 20 I can do more 2 weeks uh, until he says alayhi 10 days or 1 week and that is it 
how do you fast? He said, I fast every single day. He said, no, fast three days every month because this is equivalent to fasting the whole year. If you fast three days a month, Allah Azza wa Jal would register you as if you have fasted the full year. Why? Because one good deed is multiplied by 10. Three days every month is a whole month. This means that you have fasted the whole year. He said, I can fast more than that, Prophet of Allah. So the Prophet has increasing him. Says, fast Mondays and Thursdays. This would mean a, a little bit more. I can do more, Prophet of Allah. Fast this, fast that, until the Prophet told him what we will find, inshallah, after the break. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So, Abdullah ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him and with his, with his father, wanted more of everything. So the Prophet told him, fast one day and skip one day throughout the whole year. This is the fasting of Dawood. Peace be upon him. He said, I can do more. He said, you, no one can do more better than that. So this is not allowed. So the Prophet instructed him to fast one day and skip one day. Now, did the Prophet ﷺ ever done such a thing? Scholars say, no. This means that when the Prophet ﷺ approves something that the companions did, yet he did not do it, this means that this is of a lower degree and grade. However, it's permissible. So it's permissible for you to do, but if you want the highest, why would you choose something lower? The highest is what the Prophet used to do alayhi salatu wasalam. So if you fast Mondays and Thursdays and the three white days for 13, 14 and 15, alhamdulillah, you've got it made more than enough. We move on to the following hadith, hadith number 102. Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari radiallahu anh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam said to Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, it would have been better if you had recited Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la, that is chapter 87, was shamsi wa duhaha, chapter 91, or wal layli idha yagsha, chapter 92, for the old, the weak, and those who have things to do, pray behind you. Sahih al-Bukhari. Jazakallahu khairan. What is the origin of this hadith? This hadith, as stated before, happened when Mu'adh ibn Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, used to pray Isha with the Prophet in the Masjid of Medina and then go to his people who did not have enough knowledge and did not accompany the Prophet because they were farmers, they were normal people. So he used to lead them in prayer, praying four rak'ahs, voluntary for him, while it is fard for them, Isha prayer. And they were people of farming, of taking care of their crops and so on. So a man who wanted to go and water his crops before going to bed, joined Mu'adh in prayer. Mu'adh that night started to recite Surah Al-Baqarah. And we know this is the longest chapter. So the man waited, 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 and uh, this is taking too long. So he retreated, finished his Isha prayer, and left to his farm to do what was needed to be done. After Isha prayer was over, the good people went to Mu'adh as usual and said to him, you know so-and-so, he left you while you were in your prayer, completed his prayer, and left to his farm. So Mu'ad said, he's a hypocrite, he's a munafiq. So the good people took that word and went to the boy, to the man. He said, do you know what Mu'ad said about you? He said that you're a munafiq. I am a munafiq? By Allah, I will go to the Prophet, So he went to the Prophet, and told him, Mu'ad does this and that, and that is why I left him and I went to water my crops. The Prophet was outraged alayhi salatu wasalam. And he called Mu'adh and said, Mu'adh, afattanun ant? Are you the one who's testing people by what you are doing by prolonging the prayer? And then he told him, wouldn't you have prayed these chapters 
which are in the middle of the Mufassal in Isha because there are people who are weak, who are ill, who are uh, needy, they have things to do. So this is the benchmark in the length of Isha prayer. And it is the benchmark of all other five prayers taken into consideration those who pray behind you. And the Prophet ﷺ called that man and said, my friend, what do you recite in your prayer? Because you finished your prayer and went, so the Prophet wanted to know. He says, I do not know your dandana, you and Mu'adh, dandana. You know, dandana in Arabic, it means is when you, as if you're singing. When you say dan, 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 you're doing this. So he's saying, I do not know your dandana, nor Mu'adh dandana. You guys, what you mumble and say, I do not understand. I ask Allah for paradise and seek protection from hellfire. This is what I know. The Prophet laughed and said, around them, we make our dandana. This is exactly what we are doing. And the man said, Mu'adh accused me of being a hypocrite by Allah. Tomorrow, when we fight, he will know who is a hypocrite. And soon afterwards, there was a battle. So they all went to defend Medina. And after the battle was over, they told Mu'adh, look at the man that you spoke about a few days ago. And they found him with a number of kafir disbelievers killed around him before they managed to kill him. About seven or eight. And Mu'adh said, by Allah, now I know who is the hypocrite. Now this is not the action of hypocrites, which means that Mu'adh admits that this is a true believer. What brought us to this subject was that whoever leads a prayer must take into consideration those praying behind him. And if he would like to prolong prayer, mashallah, you know Quran and you love your voice, pray night prayer as much as you want. Four hours, five hours, take your time. But when you lead people in prayer, don't impress them. Try your best to be brief and to be praying the perfect uh, prayer. We open the floor for your questions. Let's take the brother's question there. Last row. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah. Like while offering salah after Surah Fatiha, is it compulsory to like uh, read the surahs in sequence or like how it is? I believe the brother is asking on the ruling on praying surahs in the first and second rak'ah in accordance to the sequence of the Quran or can we flip? Yeah. It's an issue of dispute among scholars but the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ states that it is permissible. Why? Because the order of the surahs are not by the order of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet only ordered them to make the order of the verses. So, for example, if we have 286 verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, the Prophet told them to put each ayah in its position. Surah Al-Imran, each ayah in its position. But he never told them, put this surah before that or this surah after that. And that is why in the authentic hadith, when one of the companions prayed with the Prophet ﷺ night prayer, and the Prophet started with Surah Al-Baqarah, the companion said he will recite a hundred ayah and then make ruku' and the Prophet went on until he finished Surah Al-Baqarah and then he started with Surah Al-Nisa and then he finished it and then started with Surah Al-Imran and then he bowed the companion said by Allah I almost did something bad and that is I almost sat down the Prophet looked to the sequence recited Baqarah Nisa Al-Imran although in the Quran it is Baqarah Al-Imran Nisa. So the Prophet ﷺ made one surah before the other. Chapter 2, 4, 3. Not only that, authentic hadith. The Prophet recited in the first rak'ah, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى In the second rak'ah, وَالشَّمْسُ ضُحَاهَا Though the order in the Quran is different. Therefore, the scholars say it is not recommended to them, but it is permissible. And I personally think that it is permissible all the way. What is not permissible, in my opinion, is to recite the end of Surah Al-Baqarah in first rak'ah 
آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون and in the second ركعة you recite آية الكرسي which is before it because then you will mix the order of the Quran though some scholars say it's okay even that is okay as long as it's in a separate ركعة I highly do not recommend it yes brother السلام عليكم شيخ my question is that suppose the imam is in the second ركعة and we have come uh, in the second rakah of the Imam. And so when the Imam goes in Tashahud, so as it is the first rakah, so what should we recite in that? The Imam is in the Tashahud position, and this is his... My first rakah. Yes, to him is the third rakah, uh, second rakah, and he has a third and a fourth. You joined him in the second, or you joined him in the Tashahud position? So you prayed the, the, the second uh, rakah with him? Yes. The second rak'ah that you prayed is your first rak'ah. And that is why when he sits, you're compelled to sit and do tashahud, but this is still your first rak'ah. When he starts or stands to pray his third, this is your second. When he prays his fourth, this is your third. He offers salam, you bring your fourth rak'ah. So whenever you join the imam, whether it's in the first, second, third, or fourth rak'ah, this is your first rakah, regardless. Yes, so but when he is in the tashahud, so what is upon me to recite that? You have to sit in the tashahud and do the tashahud with him in the first rakah for you because following the imam is a must and that is why if the imam forgets and instead of sitting for the second tashahud, he stands up for the third rakah, do you say, hey, hey, wait, you pull him down? No, you have to go. But I didn't do my tashahud. You don't do your tashahud. You have to follow the imam. So following the imam is quite essential. This side, Abdurrahman. Uh, Sheikh, we spoke about uh, the different actions we do in salah. A person after sujood, when he's standing up, uh, is there a particular way in which he's to place his hands on the ground uh, while getting up, like the fist closed, or you know, by keeping the whole palm there? It's an issue of dispute. When I stand up, those who say that there isn't a need for you to put your hands first when you go for prostration, those who say you go on your knees first and then your hands, when you stand up, you, you remove your hands and stand with your knees. So they have no problem with your question. Your question is regarding those who fall on their hands and then their knees. When they stand up, it's an issue of dispute. Some of the scholars authenticate, they make it hadith sahih, that the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he stood up, he used to make as the one who make, is preparing the dough. You know the dough? So people who make the dough, they do this as in the fist. And some say you do it on your fingers. And alhamdulillah, it's wide. I personally use this fist methodology, which we have learned from Sheikh Nasr al-Din al-Bani long time ago. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have until we meet next time fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.